First, I'd like to thank Ms. Oprah Winfrey and Chancellor Henry Yang for opening our online commencement ceremony. Your words and actions inspire us daily. And now it is my distinct pleasure to congratulate the CCS graduates of 2019-20 and 2020-21, whom we celebrate today. My sincere congratulations. Now in a normal ceremony, I would at this point recognize individual members of the College of Creative Studies faculty who would be physically in attendance at this event. While we do not have the luxury of gathering in person at this time, I wish to express to you, my colleagues, collectively, my sincere gratitude for your efforts and dedication in guiding our junior colleagues, now graduates, in particular during this trying year. Thank you. Next, I would turn to a fact well known across campus, that the people who really make things work are the staff. And CCS is fortunate to boast a small but dynamic team deserving of the highest praise. And because they have thrown us all on their backs and carried us through this infrastructurally complicated year, I will take a moment to express my appreciation to these staff, who you graduates all know, or at least have relied on, over the course of your studies in our college. Frank Bauman, Lynn Clark, Neil Geronimo, Jen Johansson, Marianne Morris, Kristen Palmstrom, Savannah Parrison, Megan Peterson, and our student staff. Michelle and Claire. Thank you. Also, on behalf of today's graduates, I would like to thank our CCS parents and donors for their support and generosity over this and previous years. Your collective support is invaluable in permitting these extraordinarily talented students to realize their potential. A privilege of my position is the opportunity to offer a few words before this online gathering. I start with the obvious. Undoubtedly, we have had a tough year. For many of us, it has been tough for personal reasons, in ways that we haven't shared with any except our closest friends and family members. In other cases, it has been tough in ways we share in common and that we have commiserated over collectively via social media, on Twitter, Instagram, and maybe Discord. We have been shaken at visceral levels as a nation by racialized violence and political polarization. It has been a tough year. Here in CCS, we've further had some challenges that hit very close to home. Just over a month ago, we lost our former student affairs officer, Sarah Sturfone, who was the heartbeat of the college for half a dozen years. All of you who knew her, even very briefly, have my deepest sympathies. At this time of reflection, for me, it is natural that I turn to what I have spent the most time thinking about over the last 25 years, ancient Mesoamerica. And I found this to be helpful in unexpected ways. For example, according to multiple Mesoamerican cosmologies, there were journeys to be taken after death. Some of these post-mortem travels led through treacherous regions. These were the kind taken by Quiche Mayan hero twins, Hunapu and Shibalanque, through Shibalba, the place of fright. There were also neutral spaces to travel through in the afterlife, and even wondrous locales. Scholars refer to one such place depicted in Mayan iconography as Flower Mountain, where food and drink were abundant and natural beauty was all around. 
You can imagine such a region centered on a waterfall and a rainforest leading into a gentle stream with plants, flowers, hummingbirds, and butterflies all about. This terrestrial paradise was thought to be so enticing, in fact, that while you were alive, you had to take care. If you happened to wander there in your dreams, you might not want to come back to live in an awakened state. In any case, it is this place of abundance, this Talokan, where I found it easy to imagine Sarah glancing over at us now and again as she tells stories and belly laughs with her newfound friends. Sarah's laughter was so contagious, it reminds me now to laugh, and that has felt healing. These memories, along with the scenarios that evoke them, these strike me as aiding the mourning process regardless of whether they're set in one imagined afterlife or another. And that's one way in which an ancient Mesoamerican concept has brought me a sense of solace in this trying time. A second Mesoamerican metaphor I've been spending some time with lately has been that of mythological world ages. Yes, this concept was stupendously misinterpreted a few years back when popular culture suggested that the Mayans predicted the end of the world. Apart from that hullabaloo though, yes, in both the Popol Vuh, which is an alphabetic record of the Quiche Mayan creation story, and in the Codex Chimalpopoca, an Aztec period central Mexican creation narrative, the indigenous authors do refer to the births and deaths of sons and the people who lived under their supervision. Multiple sons came and went, and peoples as well as environments were created and destroyed. This much is written, but what is often ignored is that in some cases, people live through these transitions. In the Codex Chimalpopoca, for example, the Toltecs are said to have lived in the fourth sun, yet they also persisted into the fifth sun and played important roles in the rise of the Aztec Empire. Such records seem to tell us that the Mesoamerican sons were conceptualized more like the moralized characterization of eras or world ages rather than all out obliterations and reconstructions of the physical world. The Popol Vuh actually imbues the end of the third sun with a quite poignant moral theme. The people of the third sun were destroyed by their own tools. Their farming and cooking equipment became animated and turned against them because that was all they did, work. No laughter, just work. That begs the question even today, how far should we allow technology to shape our lives? To what purpose and at what cost? Certainly, these are questions for the ages. In any case, the reason I found myself drawn to these conceptions of Mesoamerican ages is that we are at a moment that seems to be screaming out for recognition as a transition between metaphorical suns. Climate change, wealth inequalities, racial and social injustice, the global rise of fascism, unprecedented abuses of power, and yes, the global coronavirus pandemic. Will these encourage us to take up a large-scale recalibration of our collective efforts and expectations? Will our, our emergence from this pandemic come with a new characterizable age? I have hope. I have hope because when I first started teaching here in the early 2000s, I felt that I had to push students to get them thinking deeply about social and environmental justice. I felt I needed to provoke them to get them to pay attention to the large-scale societal and environmental issues at our collective doorstep. But not anymore. Today's students are hungry for engagement with the impossible problems, with issues of sustainability on all levels. And I have hope because I see CCS as part of the solution. I see CCS as the place where incredibly motivated, curious, and accomplished students excel in their chosen fields, but also providing the opportunity to take up consideration of the impossible problems we all face. This group of graduates inspires hope in the experiences they've had through the college, which include, and this is obviously not an exhaustive list, that they have, in their words, led chants at the Women's March in Rome, developed a video conferencing platform that improves communication for autistic people, worked with the Cheadle Center for Biodiversity and Ecological Restoration as a restoration technician and researched small vertebrate responses to restoration around campus, had a piece of music premiered in Vienna, Austria, learned that my fascination with parasites, types of slime from intertidal worms, and paralytic shellfish syndrome are not dinner conversation became a part of it, particle physics researcher and contributed to the research from muon colliders. Survived multiple wildfires, 
a blackout, and a pandemic in four years. Work simultaneously in the Menard Green Chemistry Lab and the Vanderwalker Archaeology Lab. Conducted research in marine bi microbiology in Alaska, presented at the joint mathematics meeting in 2019, and advocated with the National Association for Women in Mathematics to senators in Washington, D.C. Got to do a master class with one of my great inspirations and some of the best songwriters I know, the Weepies. Raised a puppy. Started playing piano again for fun. Participated in outreach activities, including physics circus. Co-wrote, directed, homebrewed a musical quest, a film about tabletop games and LGBT plus teens. These experiences and countless others speak to the passion, ingenuity, and boundless curiosity of CCS students and bolster our faith in your generation. It's not that we now have or will soon solve all impossible problems here within the walls of our funky little building, but that we can put in place the venues and the means of working toward such goals. It does take courage to step outside your chosen field of study, one in which you are just getting comfortable, to trust that others will recognize the potential of dialogue across disciplines. But it is happening in some classes and in informal conversations after hours, and it will again as we return to campus over the summer and into the fall. I have hope because my faith that you can lead us into a new age builds from the core of what CCS is about. And this gets to what I hope you will take away with you as you look back on your time here. Yes, you will and should look back fondly on the friendships you've found and nurtured, on the risks you've taken, on the success you've achieved, but I hope you will not forget that CCS is the place that champions curiosity. Whereas in other college experiences, the goals may be to demonstrate mastery of the known, the faculty and your peers at CCS have pushed you, as your stories attest, to stand at the edge of what is known and to peer out, looking for the materials and the ideas that can be used to construct a road into the unknown. Caminante, no hay camino. Se hace camino al andar. You may recall that those words by Antonio Machado we took up at the beginning of the year when the pandemic threw us into a global unknown. Now they hold renewed meaning. Now we all stand at what looks like the end of one Mesoamerican sun and the beginning of another. For you, graduates, in your personal lives as you complete your baccalaureate education and envision what comes next. But also we as a society face the choice of looking back to the known and seeking comfort in what we thought was normal or peering into an unknown as we reflect on a tough year along with what led up to it and what we will learn from it. I hope today you can look around at the faces of those who have gotten you through it all, some in person, some perhaps on Zoom, and some maybe only in photographs, and use the energy you gain from them along with the spirit you've nurtured at CCS to collectively imagine a path into a new future, a more inclusive future, a more just future, a more sustainable future. I have hope. And here too, it's the laughter of fond memories and hopeful futures that will nourish us on the journey. On behalf of the faculty and staff of the College of Creative Studies, I offer to you and your close ones, hearty congratulations and our best wishes. Thank you. Each year, the college invites a member of our distinguished alumni to address the graduating class. This year, I have the honor and very real pleasure of introducing Ms. Chanel Miller. Chanel Miller is a writer and artist who received her BA in literature from the College of Creative Studies. Her critically acclaimed memoir, Know My Name, was a New York Times bestseller, a New York Times book review notable book, and a New York Book Critics Circle Award finalist, as well as a Best Book of 2019 in Time, The Washington Post, The Chicago Tribune, NPR, and People, among others. She is a 2019 Time Next 100 honoree and was named one of Glamour's 2016 Women of the Year. Know My Name will be published in over 15 countries. Miller now lives in New York City. Chanel?
Hello, class of 2020 and 2021. I am honored to be speaking to you all today. In 2014, I sat on stage for CCS graduation and everyone had a little note card that had your name and a few accomplishments and future plans listed below. So we would go up one by one and hand the note card to the dean and he'd read them aloud. I was a literature major, so my accomplishments were winning small poetry competitions. And as I was waiting my turn, all the brilliant CCS physics and math kids were going up, getting their awards announced for winning quantum, whatever, going off to these amazing grad schools. And my accomplishments paled in comparison. So I crossed everything off my note card and I wrote, Chanel Miller is going to be moving in with her parents. And the dean read it and everybody cheered. And that's what I did. In the summer of 2014, I moved in with my parents into my childhood home in Palo Alto. I got a job as a hostess at a Chinese restaurant. And the only reason that the position was open was because a 19 year old who worked there was going to leave to begin her freshman year at UCLA. So that was quite depressing. I spent most of my time scooping rice, sweeping leaves, folding napkins, and seating people. I then worked at a tiny bookstore at the bottom of a hotel next to the airport. So on my breaks, I would ride the elevator to the highest floor in the hotel and look out at the airport runway and watch planes take off and wish that I was on any one of those planes. I wanted to be so far from where I was in any life that was not mine. I just felt so stagnant and like I had already failed at that time. I finally get a job at this startup that makes educational apps for kids, which is cool. But in January, 2015, seven months after graduation, things took a sad turn and many of you already may be familiar with my story from the news. I went to a party at Stanford University I was sexually assaulted outside on the ground while unconscious and two Swedish graduate students saw what was happening, intervened and caught my attacker. I pressed charges and began this long, grueling journey through the legal system where I was protected under the pseudonym Emily Doe. In the year and a half that followed the assault, I ended up having to leave my job in order to focus on my case to mentally and emotionally prepare to testify and to recover. Court dates are always being canceled and rescheduled, pushed out for many months, and things would get a lot worse before they would get better. I think a lot about how that year of my life and this past year in lockdown have had a lot of parallels. The scaffolding of your life dissolves. You may feel like you're regressing, the dates of when you think things would open and resume normalcy kept getting pushed back and was entirely out of your control. And the life you imagined for yourself may have disappeared. So I just want to say that living in a sustained state of uncertainty and upheaval is really hard. And I hope that you credit yourselves for just getting by in any way that you could this past year. You have been subjected to an unnatural amount of change and should feel proud just for getting through. Anyway, back to my case. At the end of the trial, the verdict arrives. My assailant is guilty, convicted of three felonies of assault and attempted rape. The final piece we had to get through was the sentencing and that would be two months later. I had an advocate and she told me that at the sentencing, I was allowed to present something called the victim impact statement. And I said, what is that? And she said, you have the opportunity to write your thoughts and feelings about what this past year has been like for you. And it was the first time in my case that I felt giddy because what nobody knew was that I had spent four years of my life in a little mustard colored building by the lagoon called the College of Creative Studies, basically getting a degree in documenting my feelings, writing short stories, translating human emotion into language. 
I sat at the large wooden conference table in the classroom. At the end of that hall, I spent hours typing and trying to print assignments using the really overheated crappy printer in the CCS computer room. I read stories at the podium in the old little theater, and I had phenomenal professors who knew me by name, who thoroughly read and analyzed every piece I ever submitted, who trained me to respect my thoughts and opinions. So when my advocate told me about the statement, I knew my assailant had selected the wrong person and that nobody knew what was coming. On June 2nd, 2016, I read aloud my victim impact statement in court, standing before the judge and my attacker. Unfortunately, the judge didn't listen and sentenced my assailant to only six months in county jail. I walked out of court that day thinking that I had failed. But the next day, my statement was published on BuzzFeed. In four days, it got 11 million views, then 18 million. Calls to rape crisis centers began surging. Letters began pouring into the courtroom from around the world. Vice President Biden, now president, wrote me a letter of encouragement. And members of Congress read it on the House floor. Two laws were changed in California to ensure that this kind of sentencing would never happen again. I was also given the opportunity to write a book. Penguin Random House gave me a contract to write 90,000 words about what had happened. And again, I said yes, because I knew I was ready. I spent the next two and a half years writing full time. In September, 2019, I revealed my identity and released my memoir, Know My Name. Since then, I've gotten to speak at the Sydney Opera House, my book translated into many languages, including Korean, Russian, Vietnamese, Romanian, I was invited into Oprah's home in Montecito, which is only 15 minutes from downtown Santa Barbara, and sat with my parents on her balcony, sipping pink lemonade, looking out at the Anacapa Islands, the same islands I had admired and could see from my freshman dorm. Now I'm figuring out what I wanna do next and imagine many of you are too. What I'm here to tell you today <laughs> is that the year I graduated, was without question the absolute worst year of my life. And to be honest, yours has probably sucked too. You're about to spend time getting job rejections, finding entry level positions, maybe living with your parents indefinitely. Things are going to be hard and bumpy, but it is not because you are inadequate or unworthy. It is because you are at the very beginning of figuring out your being. What I ask is that when things get dark, you understand that you are nowhere near close to the end of your story. I do not know where you will go or what you will do, but I do know where you've been. I know that we share a common home called CCS. I know that you possess a distinct kind of knowledge, even if you don't know how you're going to use it yet. Trust that. Trust me when I say that you are ready for whatever may greet you. To the class of 2020 and 2021, I applaud you immensely. I respect your ability to move forward even when the world feels like it's chaotic and crumbling. And I know in my bones that each of you will find your way. Thank you. Thank you, Chanel. I now have the pleasure of presenting two students who have been chosen to speak for the College of Creative Studies commencement celebration. Amelia Rodriguez was nominated to speak today by Professor Cara Mae Brown, who writes, Amelia thrived in CCS. She is a tremendous poet and a savvy researcher. She's taken advantage of a lot of unique opportunities and is very much involved in the community. Amelia. As my time at the College of Creative Studies draws to a close, I naturally find myself reflecting on my first days as part of the school. I'm a transfer student, so I have to think back only two years. At my first all-college meeting, then interim dean Bruce Tiffany asked each and every student to share their name aloud. Dressed in double denim, as was our theme that year, I listened to each person introduce themselves and wondered whether I really belonged among all those brilliant students. I loved writing, sure, but what did that matter? Was I good enough at it? 
how would I prove my worth? In the two years since, I've learned many of the names I heard that day, and I've done many things in CCS. I've grabbed snacks in the front office and spent hours collaging chapbooks with my classmates. I've led a course, written a book, and read Beowulf. So many translations of Beowulf. For those unfamiliar with the story, allow me to summarize. Our capable but arrogant hero Beowulf begins by sailing to the land of the Danes to defeat the monster Grendel, who has been eating the Danes because they won't stop partying all night. I'm sure those who have lived in IV can relate. He does beat Grendel, taking off his arm and saving the Danes. At the end of the book, Beowulf slays a dragon, but he dies in the process. Some days during my time at CCS, I felt like Beowulf. I was powerful, confident. I could do whatever needed to be done. But more often, especially early on, I felt more like Grendel. Sleepless, annoyed that my neighbors wouldn't stop making noise, feeling like my arm was about to fall off if I wrote another word. Eventually, though, I realized something. Beowulf and Grendel both tend to fight alone. All of us don't have to. I miss being with you all in person. I miss the coziness of the old little theater, the chatter coming from rooms full of math majors scrawling blackboard-sized equations. But it is strange how connected you can feel even when learning is remote. Even as the digital space threatens to literally box us in, we find ways to transcend the borders of our Zoom squares and create community. Think of the collective delighted gasp when somebody's pet makes an appearance. Think of the running stream of chat comments when someone shares their work in a Zoom room, all quoted lines and words of encouragement. When it comes to belonging at CCS, it matters, of course, that I love writing. It matters that we love physics, chemistry, art. But I've learned during my time here that to do something with love doesn't just mean the love of the thing. I feel most worthy of my place in this community when a friend texts to suggest we swap poems for a revision, when a younger student asks my advice. I see community all around me, the way CCS students share knowledge, support one another, spam group chats. Class of 2021, I hope that as we enter the world beyond this college, we take that collaborative spirit with us. I hope our future employers, colleagues, friends, see us not just as great scholars, researchers, creators, but as people dedicated to loving others, aiding them in slaying their dragons, and asking for help in slaying our own. Congratulations, class of 2021. I love you, and I can't wait to see what we do. Thank you, Amelia. Shahira El Aboudi was nominated to speak today by her Community Council co-chair, Michelle Chu. Michelle writes, Shay is super involved in CCS and was a main member of the Community Council. She made every meeting so much fun. She's creative, old, and charismatic. Shay. I have had the extraordinary privilege of attending this fairly odd, very small, magical college with you all the past four years. This has been my most engaging and intriguing educational experience. And if there are any words worth remembering from this speech, they are thank you. Just two words in return for four years of haphazard dinners, watching the CCS microwave wind down and reading the layers of wisdom and nonsense scrawled on our walls and for late nights crowded around an OLT chalkboard to the sound of someone's piano study break, and for water fountain conversations, trading passions with someone just as stoked about what they're creating as you. We owe these past four years in no small part to our incredible faculty, who in addition to being forces of creative inquiry in their own disciplines, actively invest themselves in curating an education for the radically curious. These are not your PowerPoint presentation professors. They've taken us for class in the field, on trips around the city, volunteered their time well past hours, and extended themselves not only as teachers, but as colleagues and friends. And our staff, 
the heart beating within the college and the glue keeping us all together. It's the folks up front doing the organizing, double checking, handing out candy, extra printer paper, and emotional support at the end of the quarter. But it's hard to even mention the positive atmosphere that permeates CCS without thinking of the contributions of Sarah Sturfone, whom our community has recently lost. If our staff is the heart of CCS, then Sarah was the blood coursing through it. She rallied us at our worst and stood behind us at our best. It's difficult to overstate what she meant to us as a community. Her presence was massive and colors each of our experiences at CCS. We love and miss you so, so much, Sarah. But along with the love and support of our faculty and staff, the Weird Nerd College would be nothing without the Weird Nerds itself. We the students, with outrageous unit loads and spontaneous academic decisions. We who don't like rules too much. And we the radically curious, who ask questions without fear of the answers or silences we might be met with. We are fascinated by this physical, emotional, and spiritual worlds we inhabit, and we've spent four years chasing down truths about them. And yet, know that we are each artists, painting models that narrowly orbit anything true at best. We love the asking, thinking, probing, out of box, stepping and creating, and we're damn good at it too. Among this class of 105, we've created symphonies, musicals, albums, galleries, publications, proofs, programs, equations, grants, from just the ion movements in our mushy little brains. Usually college is the place of dreaming. We get the luxury of studying the world in intricate detail without the pressure of carving into it a place for ourselves. We are supposed to learn and ask questions at a distance from the weighty consequences of adult life, which slow the step of our older peers. But consequence came for us whether we were ready or not. This past year, we had to ask questions whose implications were real, personal, and near. Some of us might have wondered at points what it looks like to live in equality and if we're doing our part to make that happen, or how we would survive one of the deadliest pandemics in human history, and if our families would, or how we might graduate and focus on classes when it feels like the world is falling apart at our feet. For me, it involved a lot of failures, a lot of taking time away from my research or studies when I needed a little extra for myself, family, and friends. I have never been more intimately aware of my own imperfections than during my time in college. And in all honesty, it hurt. I spent a lot of time wishing I could do or be more and painfully surprised that in the grand scheme of the world, I am small. <laughs> Going to school with such a talented group is uncomfortably humbling, yes, but relieving. I've been surprised at what happens when I fail, nothing among my lab, community council, my friends in and outside of CCS, there was communal slack to pick up and let out, each of us weaving our successes and failures together like a net, sharing tension collectively as an invincible whole composed of imperfect, highly invincible parts. So in short, this is a very long thank you letter to all of you. Thank you for teaching me that I am the imitable fraction of the inimitable collective force, which is us that I and you and we will continue weaving ourselves together in with other imperfect humans throughout our lives, amounting to things that help people, make them think, save their lives, bring them joy and give them hope. Class of 2021, you are nothing and you are everything. Thank you, Shay. Each year, the faculty are invited to recognize a student for their service to the college. I now turn to Professor John Lotto, chair of the CCS Faculty Executive Committee, to announce this year's award. As chair of the CCS Faculty Executive Committee, it's my great pleasure to announce the 2021 Sarah Stephone Student Service Award. This award recognizes outstanding contributions by a graduating senior to the intellectual and social functions of the college. The award was renamed this year in memory of former lead academic advisor, Sarah Stephone, to honor her many contributions to the college. We have two awards this year. Our first award goes to Michelle Chu. 
Michelle has been a CCS ambassador since day one, and there are few programs or events that she's not been involved with. From attending regional receptions, to being a CCS orientation leader, from working with the community council, to establishing a sustainable peer mentoring program and contributing to a virtual graduation, Michelle has positively impacted CCS students at all stages of their career. For her dedication, commitment and service to the college, it is my pleasure to award the CCS Sarah Stephone Student Service Award to Michelle Chu. Our second and final award this year goes to Meredith Nair. Meredith has also been involved in the peer mentoring program and in providing guidance to prospective students. She participated in student panels and her advisor called her the most active student participating in CCS and UCSB life, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. For her dedication, commitment and service to the college, it's my pleasure to award the CCS Sarah Stephone Student Service Award to Meredith Nair. Please join me in congratulating and thanking both Michelle and Meredith for their exemplary service to the CCS community. Thank you, Michelle and Meredith. Thank you, John. And thank you and congratulations to Michelle and Meredith. It is a tradition in the College of Creative Studies commencement ceremony to feature a work by graduating seniors in music composition. This year, we have two CCS music composition students who have composed pieces for the musical portion of our ceremony. The ceremony was opened by three pieces by Ashley Petrie, Oceans and Clouds 1, Oceans and Clouds 5, Ocean, and Oceans and Clouds 8. Of this work, Ashley tells us, this piece consists of eight movements, all for different arrangements of French horn, bassoon, and piano, and all relating to the title Oceans and Clouds. The first movement I wrote was actually the fifth movement, which I wrote while I was abroad in England during my third year. The rest have all been written since I returned, and a majority were written during the pandemic. This piece allowed me to combine the landscapes and nature that I observed while living in Bristol, England, and Santa Barbara, California, to find some common beauties between the two. Movements one and eight, both titled Oceans and Clouds, are inspired by the combination of these beautiful sceneries and incorporate ideas from each of the other movements, representing the work as a whole. Try to imagine yourselves in these landscapes and take a journey with the performers as they explore their new environments. In closing, we will listen to two pieces by Angelina Picasso. Of these, Angie writes, La Chicana was birthed after coming across a poem by Gloria Anzaldúa, a queer Latina activist, called To Live in the Borderlands. I wanted to highlight this powerful poem by having it as a spoken word piece over a darker salsa sound. While awaiting permission from the publisher to use this poem, I began writing the opening portion of the piece, but soon realized I was not going to get permission as soon as I would have liked if at all, so I continued without the poem and renamed it La Chicana. Once the text was taken out, I had to do some thinking as to what direction I wanted to take it. I had trouble initially with writing a catchy enough melody to carry through the piece. I did a lot of musical research by listening to a variety of salsa classics, such as Vivir Mi Vida by Mark Anthony, to inform my ear of the essential factors in a salsa piece. It took a bit of trial, error, and frustration but once completed, it was and is my favorite piece I have composed in my years at UCSB. I hope you are able to dance along to it in your seats. Reminiscence, written in the spring of 2020, came to fruition in Music 106 orchestration as a class assignment. While I did not have a clear inspiration for the piece, the melody and sonority had an almost nostalgic quality to me, which seemed fitting since I would be heading into my final year of undergrad in just a few months' time. As I listen to the piece more, I imagine this piece to be a soundtrack for a coming-of-age film where the protagonist is entering their last days in high school or college and reflecting on their past. Thank you, Angie and Ashley, and once again, my congratulations to all of you CCS graduates and to your parents, friends, 
and family who have made your achievements possible.